I am speaking on behalf of Dwayne Cardona, who uh, became a very good friend of David's, and I feel quite uh, privileged that he has asked me to do this because he and I and David were, had a great interest in what has been called the Proto-Saturnian system, the arrangement of planets that was uh, apparent to our ancient and prehistoric forebears. So Elizabeth, this is uh, from Dwayne, and since he's given me 30 slides in 30 minutes, I'm going to have to read his uh, stuff without any repetition or uh, <laughs> interpolation. Okay, so the Proto-Saturnian system's linear alignment, and this seems to be a common thread through all of the uh, research that's been done. Dwayne writes, there have been quite a few colleagues who have patted me on the back for having not only agreed with their controversial works, but also and mainly for contributing further to their endeavours. I shall name no names in what I have to say, but alas, how many of them have dropped me, not to say slapped me, once I opposed, challenged or even simply questioned whatever it was that they happened to have assumed. I have been raked through the mud, to use an old cliché, and called various names by those with whom I happen to have disagreed. Others whose views I happen to have questioned have attempted to belittle me and my work, insinuating that the results of my investigation stem from ignorant amateurism. And yet there have been others who have not only taken my criticisms in their stride, but who have remained on friendly terms with me despite our different opinions. One such person with whom I have debated our differences through the years while remaining steadfast friends was the person whose memory we are here to honour in this memorial, my good departed comrade, David Selkelt. One of the issues about which David and I disagreed concerned the Proto-Saturnian configuration. As I, together with other colleagues of mine, have posited, this configuration involved three planets, Venus, Mars and Earth, in a linear configuration that was axially strung along the Birkeland current emanating from Proto-Saturn's southern pole. Not only that, but taking our cue from Ralph Jurgens, some of us have accepted that this configuration had been travelling outside the demarcation of the solar system before it penetrated the Sun's heliospheric boundary on its way towards the Sun. It is not that David himself did not agree with this, in fact he did. As he pointed out to me towards the end of 2010, such a configuration could only have existed while it was travelling through the Sun's heliosphere. Prior to that, while it had still been outside the solar system, the configuration's planetary brood would have been in equatorial orbit around proto-Saturn. The mathematical calculations he conducted led him to believe that the transformation of the equatorially orbiting planets into a linear configuration would have taken 80 years maximum to 30 years minimum. Having visited Lynn Rose in Casa Grande, Arizona in October of the same year, David said he had debated this concept with him and that Rose was in total agreement with him. As I pointed out to David in February of the following year, Rose's agreement on this issue surprised me. Since, throughout the years, he had been vociferously adamant that at no time would the Proto-Saturnian configuration have ever achieved polar linearity. Rose and I had debated this point for years, and unless David misunderstood him, it was heartening to hear that he had finally accepted it even if only for the relatively short duration of the configuration's passage through the heliosphere. Truth be told, however, Rose's view and David's had earlier been proposed by Wallace Thornhill. Allow me, however, to backtrack a little. <laughs> this is a photo Dwight took of me at the 1995 uh, um, centenary celebration of Velikovsky's birth in New York. We had a lot of fun together, David and I, on that trip. Allow me, however, to backtrack a little. As I had stated back in 1978, 
this axial planetary coupling had been the greatest stumbling block in my own unraveling of the Proto-Saturnian scenario. As far as I knew at that particular time, there were no such coupled bodies known from anywhere in the universe. Worse than that, I was also under the false impression that celestial <coughs> mechanics, as then known, would not allow for such coupling. Despite bold attempts by others to solve this problem, I could never accept any of the theoretical underpinnings they proposed for such linearity. And yet, that such linear formations did exist in space eventually came to me through the discovery of the jetting star designated as HD 163296 that I had come across while browsing through the internet. I had actually circulated a photograph of this formation that included three objects strung along its axial jet during the private roundtable discussion by the speakers at the Cronia Communications World Conference held in Portland, Oregon in September 2000. That was an unforgettable meeting. Unfortunately, the astrophysicist Halton Arp, who was also present, mistook the photograph for the controversial runaway body that was said to be streaming away from the double star system known as TMR1, which he therefore brushed away as irrelevant to the discussion that was taking place. I was, however, <clears throat> very elated when during the same round of discussions, Arp himself declared that linear formations are not uncommon in the cosmos. When, a month later, I asked him what linearly coupled formations he had in mind, he referred me to Herbig Harrow objects concerning which he himself had already published two photographs of the one designated as HH34. He was actually apologetic when I told him that the photograph of HD 163296 that I had circulated in Portland delineated just such an object spurting star. Although the first of these formations had been detected in the 19th century, the discoverer, Shelburne Wesley, had no idea what it was he had discovered. It was not until the independent studies by George Herbig and Guillermo Harrow, for whom the objects became named, that by the 1940s these formations began to be understood as possible stellar formative structures. Let no one think that these objects are rare throughout our galaxy. There are actually hundreds of them, maybe even more. More than that, and this is what I had, had attracted me to these objects in the first place, the system associated with HD 163296, the picture of which I had circulated at the Cronia conference, was actually labelled by NASA as a young planetary system. Once this confusion between ARP and I was settled, in other words, once he realised that he had mistaken the photograph I had circulated for an entirely different object, he let me know that he too was of the opinion that planets could be formed through stellar ejected axial currents. As he explained, and this is a quote, the HH objects, Herbig Harrow objects, indeed show luminous knots obviously ejected in a line from a central source. I included a picture of HH34 in my book, Seeing Red. The purpose of that inclusion is to demonstrate that such ejections happen on both galactic and stellar scales in the universe. And he has in italics, I personally consider the outrageous possibility that planets could originate in such fashion also. End of quote. Although Arp gave me permission to divulge the views he expressed to me in private, he was also adamant to keep his musings in context. Thus, to be fair, none of the above is to say that Arp agrees with the Proto-Saturnian scenario. Stellar collimated bipolar outflows, also known as jets, uh, similar to the Birkeland current axis that joined the planets in the Proto-Saturnian <coughs> configuration, are now known to be common in interstellar space. They are, in fact, part and parcel of Herbig Harrow objects. Cosmic linearity, however, is not to be encountered merely in Her Herbig Harrow objects. Comets, too, have been known to exhibit linear formations. One of the best examples of such cometary configurations was dramatically displayed in July 1994, when comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 broke into 21 fragments that ended up strung out like pearls on a string before catastrophically ploughing into the planet Jupiter. 
It was in fact this comment that Wallace Thornhill has been promoting as an example of the manner in which the Proto-Saturnian system could have been linearly formed. Just as it was Jupiter's gravitational pull that was responsible for the fragmentation of the comet and the stretching of those fragments into their now famous lineup, so also, according to Thornhill, was the Sun's heftier attraction responsible for the breakup of the Proto-Saturnian system into its linear planetary configuration. And as already noted, this was the reasoning that David Selkel adhered to too. Comets, however, need not fragment in order to resolve themselves into a string of linear formations. As Marinus van der Sluis has brought to the attention of his readers in relation to this subject, comets can sprout as many as three separate tails. Those tails designated as type 1 can sometimes exhibit bright knots of condensed matter strung out along their rectilinear emissions. For all, fair enough, with or without such condensed lumps, comets remain denizens of the solar system and thus subjected to the sun's influence. Yet how much different is that from Herb herbig Hera objects which are subjected to the influence of their host stars? Would not the planets that were linear aligned within proto-Saturn's axial current have also been subjected to their host star before they were disrupted by our present sun on entry into the solar system's sphere of influence? As it finally had to be admitted, the most important aspect of the herbig harrow phenomenon is arguably the unique insights which it has provided into the processes that lead to the formation of stars. That leads to the ejection of quasars from galaxies. As Brian Hills points out, this is an unorthodox idea, but one that is slowly gaining ground. As he explains, and I quote, the ejection process usually involves shooting pairs of quasars in opposite directions out from the active uh, center of the galaxy along the poles of the galaxy. Indeed, pairs of quasars in the central galaxy often lie on a straight line. As Arp himself found reason to ask, if stars and quasars can be ejected in this manner, why not planets? And that, to be sure, was quite a daring proposal, even by one who, for other reasons, had already been ostracized from the scientific community. Planetary systems outside our own solar one were still considered somewhat hypothetical at the time Ralph Jurgens considered Earth to have belonged to just such an array. Today, multiple planet systems are held to be quite common beyond the sun. Some of these systems, which may have been spawned by brown dwarf stars, have been described as bizarre configurations. As far as the accepted theory is concerned, planets coagulated out of the debris, said to be mainly dust and gas, contained in circumstellar disks. What was being discovered in exoplanetary systems, however, was turning this theory, known as core accretion, on its head. If planets were really formed out of circumstellar disks, they should end up circling in the same direction as their host star's rotational vector. On the contrary, quite a few exoplanets were found to be orbiting in the opposite direction of their host star, which astronomers at the European Southern Observatory consider <coughs> a serious challenge to current theories of planet formation. Not only that, but newer models of planet formation keep being upset by newer discoveries. As Hal Leveson, then at the Southwest Research Institute in Boulder, Colorado, stated, and I quote him word for word, these models are crap. They may be the best we can do, but they are still crap. End of quote. And yet, while he criticizes the prevailing core accretion model, he continues to champion it, believing that it only needs to become more sophisticated. Where have we heard all this before? The core accretion model continues to be adhered to even in the face of debilitating facts. Thus what has been called a suspected bulge in the circumstellar disk surrounding the nearby star Beta Pictoris has been determined to be a giant gas planet even though the star itself is believed to be too young to have had the time to foster any progeny. And the answer to that? The attending planet, said to be nine times the mass of Jupiter, had to have formed incredibly fast, discarding earlier theories concerning the much slower accretion of planets. So similarly with another relatively nearby star, codenamed UX Tau A, that has revealed a gap within its circumstellar disk, 
that is believed to have been cleared by a planet that has formed within it. But as with the bulge in the Beta Pictoris disc, UX Tau A is believed to still be, quote, in the first flushes of youth, end of quote, and thus too young to have given rise to a new planet. I might say that the reports keep coming in almost uh, weekly of anomalies in uh, exoplanet discoveries, stars that shouldn't exist and planets that shouldn't exist. That's my statement, not Dwight's. But never mind exoplanetary systems, as the science journalist Robert Matthews pointed out not too long ago, and I quote, even our own solar system has raised questions over the viability of the traditional textbook account of how planets form, end of quote. Problems with the core accretion model, or solar nebula theory as it is also called, has actually driven cosmologists to venture into theoretical pastures they would have once thought outrageous. But despite what they see taking place in Herbig Harrow objects, only few of them have taken plasma physics into consideration. That planets are formed through the fissioning of stellar bodies rather than through the accretion of debris within circumstellar disks is now being seriously considered. In fact, that the very electromagnetic fields shaping stellar jets end up playing a supporting role in the formation of solar systems and that this can eventually lead to the creation of planets like Earth is now believed to be highly likely. And to be sure, these jets or collimated outflows are now thought to be explainable by the dynamical effects of more than one planet. The physics behind the formation of stellar jets, like this one, was replicated in 2009 through supercomputerization by a team of physicists at Imperial College London, England. What was of additional importance is that the replicated jet actually showed how the knots embedded in these outflows are formed. Although, naturally enough, the replicated system was merely a computerized artificiality, it closely resembled what astrophysicists observe in real stellar jets, and that's a quotation, and has therefore been touted as one of the greatest astrophysical experiments that's ever been done. According to the Nobel laureate Hans Alfvén, it is vast magnetic vortices in space operating through what is known as a pinch effect that draws plasma together to form not only galaxies and galaxy clusters, but also stars and planets. And it is the jet embedded knots in question, more correctly known as plasmoids, that evolve into planetesimals and eventually into planets. Alfvén spent most of his career developing plasma cosmology <coughs> And, despite the fact that astrophysicists continue to ignore most of his claims, as Anthony Peratt tells us, modern discoveries continue to support him. Peratt, who had acted as, as Alfvén's secretariat, continues to champion this revolutionary concept. As he had it stated, and I quote, Cosmic bodies are formed out of the original intersolar or intergalactic plasma through which the currents are flowing that causes the pinching of the plasma down to a dense state. Then, at least according to my book, or rather Al Fain and the Department of Physics at the Royal Institute of Technology, matter accretes inwards to form planetesimals and eventually planets. If that is the manner in which planets are really formed, and this I have to stress, the linearly <coughs> aligned Proto-Saturnian system would have to have been primordial that is, long before it was captured into the present solar system. One criticism against this concept that has been raised by more than one person concerns the apparent absence of linearly aligned planetary systems. Despite the plasmoids that are seen embedded in Herbig Harrow jets, no linearly aligned planets <coughs> have yet been detected among the newly discovered exoplanetary systems. Such visible absence should not, however, be wondered at Exoplanets are mainly detected, although with but few exceptions hardly ever imaged, through the dimming and or slight wobble of their host star that is produced as they transit or pass across uh, the star in their circumstellar orbits. Planets in linear alignment with their host star will not cause it to dim or wobble since they do not orbit across it. This is one aspect of linearly aligned planets that is sometimes not well grasped since such planets are not in orbit around anything. In fact, whether viewed directly or obliquely, linearly aligned planets would not be seen to move at all since at their distance and apparent size, 
their axial rotation is too difficult to be detected with present instruments. As it has been reported, even NASA's sophisticated Kepler spacecraft can only detect those exoplanets that transit their stars from our point of view. So there are many worlds that it won't detect. As I told David Salkeld three months before the unfriendly Reaper took him away from us, I could have included more to all of this, but at the risk of losing its viability through summarization, I will add this much. Judging by what has been and continues to be discovered in the world's Arctic regions, a stationary source of heat located in Earth's north celestial pole is not only called for, but has actually been implied by mainstream paleontologists. And in order for this stationary source of heat to accomplish all that has been discovered, it needs to have been in existence since day one. I will not say that I would have been able to convince uh, David concerning all of this had he not left us so unexpectedly. There are others who have accepted the proto-Saturnian scenario without having yet been convinced of this particular stance. But I would have loved to have continued the debate with him till the end of time. Because when all is said and done, it was his friendly attitude that had drawn me to him. It was back in 1999 that David invited me to spend some time at his home following the SIS Silver Jubilee event at which I was honoured to present a paper. Wallace Thornhill, who had previously been a guest at the Salkeld's home, told me to prepare myself to be treated like a king. <laughs> and I definitely was, with David conducting me on several tours of nearby and not so nearby areas of historical interest. <clears throat> while his wife Elizabeth pampered me with one regal repast after another. Three years later, in August of 2002, the Salkelds were my guests at my much humbler home in Vancouver, and my wife Galia and I showed them around our little corner of British Columbia. I am so happy to say that Galia and Elizabeth hit it well, while David and I, naturally enough, spent most of our time talking shop. We had hoped to spend more time with each other and in respect of another discussion that got us involved in February of 2004, he wrote me the following. Best would be that you decide to visit us, bringing Galia, of course, we could talk catastrophes and the ladies could discuss gardens. <laughs> <coughs> Elizabeth is out in ours now. She sends her greetings to both of you and so do I. Although we did continue to communicate for a few years after that, I did not take him up on that invitation. I now wish I had. Thank you for listening. <laughs> it was Dwyer who inspired me with his uh, articles in Kronos which seemed to be pushing the boundaries of uh, both the science and the uh, ancient reports of what was seen in the sky right to their very limits. And I was excited by that because I think uh, both David and Dwaidu and I were all very interested in how did we get here? I mean, this is the big question. And this goes right to the heart of it. Anyway, if anyone has a question that I think I can answer, I'm happy to uh, spend some minutes. spoken to you about what's happened after the breakout. I mean, in 1999, at lunch, I said, what's your ideas about this? And he said, oh, we have to wait for my book. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the refrain we hear all the time. And Dwight, how many books has he got out now? I think four uh, massive volumes. And his research is mm -hmm. uh, meticulous. I saw his library in the basement uh, when I visited him with uh, Ev Cochran some years ago and was very impressed. And that is what's drawn me to his work, is the fact that he documents everything. You can check it up for yourself. As to the question of what happened after the breakup, I have some ideas, but they're conjectural. Um, it seems obvious that uh, the alignment began to waver, began to swing about because of the various aspects that we seem to see in the reports of uh, the ancient skies. Uh, Venus uh, appears to have been uh, split off from uh, proto-Saturn as a means of proto-Saturn trying to achieve electrical stability in this new environment of the Sun's electrical uh, sphere. 
So as a comet, of course, it was spewing material out and forming probably the mother of all comets. And it appeared to circle around Saturn at first and then uh, form part of the linear configuration. Mars in all of this appeared to be acting like a charge carrier. It would move, be attracted towards Venus or Venus would move towards it. There would be an electrical exchange which uh, reduced Mars' apparent gravity so it would drop towards the Earth. When it got close to the Earth, the same thing would happen and Mars would then move back up the column to receive charge and it would oscillate like an oscillating charge carrier. So this is the stories of Mars being a giant in one epoch and a, a dwarf or re-entering the mother's womb uh, stories um, uh, make sense physically in this kind of electrical explanation. But of course in doing this the Earth was moving further away from proto-Saturn each time. So eventually uh, the Sun's gravitational influence or that of maybe Jupiter if, because coming into the solar system we would have been uh, a, um, a bull in a china shop and coming close to one of the other gas giants would have been enough to destabilize the whole thing and that may, may be what actually happened. Once the Venus, Mars and Earth were separated from proto-Saturn and I think that happened fairly late in the, uh, in the story they would then have to transact electrically with the sun and the sun's environment. So we would have all been comets to some degree. Uh, the electrical exchange, I believe, is one of the energy sources that allowed us to survive such a catastrophic scenario. Because, uh, as the electric universe points out, the energy of the sun and the energy uh, comes from outside the solar system the galaxy provides it. And therefore, anybody in the galaxy, whatever the situation, will receive electrical energy. Uh, so there is an ameliorating factor in all of this. And I think the electrical input in a cometary discharge was enough to keep us alive, even though uh, our changes in uh, heat input from the sun varied wildly. And this seems to have been reported also. So uh, I think it all happened very late uh, and it would have been uh, according to the astronomer Tom Van Flanden, he talks about the range of influence of a, uh, an asteroid or a comet uh, over which it can maintain a satellite and beyond a certain distance the sun's gravitational pull or that of a nearby planet is enough to separate the two. In the case of proto-Saturn entering into the solar system, it would have got close enough to one of the big bodies or to the sun initially to destabilize the whole system and break it apart. Dwido and I, and I, I joined, well, I think David uh, sided with me on the idea that uh, the linear arrangement could not have been primordial, but Dwido insists that it must have been, and at present I can't see any way that could have been possible, but I will discuss that later this afternoon. So, it's such a huge question and the, uh, the picture that comes out of all of this is almost mind-boggling. I, I try and imagine what it must have been like for those early peoples trying to understand what was going on. Uh, at one moment it appeared like doomsday, at another moment the most amazing sights in the sky that everyone scrambled to try and chisel into rock. Uh, it must have been uh, both uh, beautiful and um, terrifying. Mm. The uh, point you make about the discharges between Mars, Venus and Jupiter as well as they move towards and away from each other. There's no mention at this point of the moon. Now, no. over the surface of the moon, it appears to have a lot of what is normally referred to as impact craters. I refer to, refer to them as discharge craters. Yes. But the impact of major eventual discharge would have that, would produce that type of um, formation on the lunar surface. Yes. Most of which are on the far side. Mm -hmm. Would the moon have been involved in this particular scenario? Yes, it could have. 
I think the Moon and Mercury uh, possibly were stripped uh, from one of the gas giants. I mean, our Moon could quite happily sit as a satellite of Jupiter and you wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to tell it from the others. Uh, so I think that uh, the, the disruption that occurred didn't occur just to proto-Saturn, uh, that uh, one or other of the gas giants may have lost some of its satellites in the process. And uh, the uh, orbital tilt of the Moon to the ecliptic and the orbital tilt of Mars to the ecliptic are similar, which suggests that they might have both been partners to one of the uh, gas giants initially. The scars on bodies, I think, arise from two main events. One is the birth of that body from a larger one, like the birth from a gas giant, like Venus from uh, proto-Saturn. And the other one is in subsequent encounters. So um, all of this throws into question the whole story of the solar system origins and of dating. How do you date all of these things? You can't because these electrical events uh, completely destroy the atomic clocks, reset them and create new ones. So, big problem. Unfortunately, geologists uh, grabbed onto radioactive dating like drowning men to a straw uh, because they could then make their uh, mainly descriptive science a hard science by putting numbers to it. Unfortunately, they picked the wrong, <laughs> the wrong horse, if you like, in that particular race. Mm. Anyway, I think uh, maybe if there aren't any other questions, um, it might give us a chance to get together and chat and uh, get to lunch on time. Thank you very much. Thank you.